The Republic of Ghana lies along the western bulge of Africa, bounded by three countries, Togo, the Ivory Coast, and Upper Volta. Ghana's area is about 92,000 square miles. Its population is 7 million. The city of Accra, capital of Ghana, is in a district which has about one half million people. Greater Accra includes the seaport of Tema, 20 miles to the east. Ghana's national monument is the Freedom Arch. The University of Ghana at Lagan includes some of the most beautiful buildings in the Accra area. Ghana's health services are available all over the country. Recently, there has been much improvement and expansion of existing hospitals, clinics, dispensaries, and health centers. The Korli Bu Hospital in Accra has been modernized and provides free medical and surgical services. In addition to government medical facilities, mission hospitals provide medical services in outlying areas. Highly qualified Ghanaian physicians, surgeons and nurses, and foreign medical personnel staff the hospitals and clinics. Mothers and children are given excellent care at rural and urban clinics. The Ghana Academy of Sciences promotes the study, extension, and dissemination of all sciences. The Ghana National Institute of Health and Medical Research was established in 1961. Its modern laboratories are in Korlebu, Accra. Research is undertaken on vector-borne diseases including malaria, filariasis, and onchocerciasis. Onchocerciasis in Ghana is transmitted by the black fly Simulium damnosum. Blindness results from invasion of the eyes by microfilariae or skin inhabiting embryos of the roundworm Onchocerca volvulus. Although most people go to clinics and hospitals for treatment, some still consult the medicine man or nature healer. In Bolgatonga, capital of the upper region, Blind and crippled persons are taught various arts and crafts in the government school for the physically handicapped. Among the items produced are hassock covers, rope, woven chairs, baby cribs, and doormats. Thus, the government rehabilitates these unfortunate persons. Ankur psychiasis is prevalent in the northern and upper regions of Ghana, comprising almost one-third of the country. The average temperature there is 83 degrees Fahrenheit. The villages are composed of mud huts, which may be joined by passageways. Surveys have been carried out by ophthalmologists in northern Ghana. In one extensive survey, about 1.4% of the persons checked were found to be blind as a result of onchocerciasis. Among the other causes of blindness were trachoma, senile cataract, measles, tuberculosis, syphilis, smallpox, and vitamin A deficiency. Many persons are infected but may not be blind. Onchocerciasis also occurs in southern Ghana, in the Aquapim Mampong area, in the Akusi Akosambo area, and in the Ho area. 
The standard used to define blindness is the inability to count fingers held at a distance of one meter, or about three and one quarter feet. A common eye affliction is keratitis, in which opacities of the cornea result from reactions to dead microfilariae of oncocercovolvulus. Blindness may result from advanced keratitis. An oncocerciasis research unit located in Bolgatonga, capital of the upper region, conducts studies on the vector fly, Simulium damnosum. The terrain surveyed is often difficult to traverse. Mosquitoes lay their eggs in still water. But in Ghana, the female fly oviposits only in fast-flowing water, having a velocity from 2.5 to 8.2 feet per second. The Black Volta River between northwest Ghana and upper Volta has vector breeding throughout the year. Breeding occurs in many narrow streams. The larvae appear as black patches on rocks, leaves, and twigs and may occur on spillways of dams. At Nangodi on the Red Volta River, breeding occurs heavily at a crossing point or drift of rocks. In Ghana, the aquatic stages of Simulium damnosum are typically found attached to submerged grasses trailing in the current. Breeding is diminished when the water is too high or when the current is too strong. Oviposition in northern Ghana usually occurs at dusk. Here, the substratum is a wooden stake in the Red Volta River at Nangodi. The flies land on the stake, walk below the surface of the water, and lay 250 to 500 whitish eggs in three to five minutes, down to one inch. Then they walk up the stake and fly away. The eggs are in strings bound together by a sticky substance which also cements them to the support. Often, strings are laid one on top of another. The white color becomes blackish in 8 to 12 hours. Here, the egg mass of one fly is on a blade of grass. In northern Ghana, the egg stage lasts from 30 to 43 hours. The eggs are oval when seen from above, but are rounded triangular in cross-section. They measure about one-fifth of a millimeter in length. The gelatinous coating protects them against desiccation, natural enemies, and insecticides. Here, collectors are examining leaves and grasses for aquatic stages of the vector. A hand lens is needed to see the pupil respiratory filaments by which species identification is made in the field. The larva of Simulium damnosum undergoes seven instars in 10 to 13 days in northern Ghana. The body is blackish cylindrical and swollen posteriorly. It consists of a small head followed by 12 segments, three in the thorax and nine in the abdomen. The larva is attached by a posterior circlet of tiny hooks. These are embedded in a sticky substance which emerges between the mouth parts. Dark flattened body scales or CT cover the larvae making them appear black. Only the Simulium damnosum larva has paired cone-shaped dorsolateral tubercles on the first five pigments of the abdomen and traces of a sixth pair on the last segment of the thorax. The branched rectal gills protrude through the anal opening. In the posterior circlet by which the larva attaches, there are 130 to 155 rows of tiny hooks. The pigmented head capsule has two small black eye spots on each side and a large rounded postgenal cleft below. The proleg, a single appendage of the prothorax, bears rows of tiny hooks. The larvae cannot swim. Instead, they move like a measuring worm. A sticky secretion emerges from the mouth. The proleg is first put into it. Then the posterior circlet is brought forward and also implanted. The head and proleg then stretch forward, and the process is repeated. Masses of larvae are often seen in dense clusters. The head has on each side an umbrella-like structure called the cephalic fan, composed of about 40 sickle-shaped rays. While feeding, the head points downstream, with the concave aspect of the fan facing the current. 
Each ray bears along its inner edge spine-like structures between which are closely packed hairs. At intervals, the fans are collapsed and the points are held close to the mouth. Each mandible then rapidly rakes off into the mouth food and other particles that have been trapped by the cephalic rays. In turbid water, sand and silt particles are ingested in large numbers. In clear water, microscopic plants, especially diatomes, often make up the bulk of the food. Microscopic crustaceans and rotifers also are ingested. If the larva is disturbed, it applies a drop of sticky secretion to its support. It then detaches and swings free in the current, the secretion continuing to be produced in small jerks, resulting in a beaded thread. When the danger passes, it returns to its support, but may also detach completely and migrate downstream. In the field, one looks especially for pupae, which are identifiable to species by examining the respiratory filaments. The pupal stage consists of the developing adult protected within a cocoon. The cocoon resembles a slipper or hoof. It is about 3.8 millimeters long and 1.7 millimeters wide. When spinning the cocoon, the mature larval form holds fast to the substratum with its posterior circlet rectal gills protruded. It then lays down an irregular pattern of threads anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly, gradually forming the sides, roof, and floor of the cocoon. The body doubles up and rotates, often for 180 degrees or more. The abdomen is swollen by a pair of silk-producing glands whose secretion emerges as a double, flattened thread between the mouth parts. A strong adhesive cements the threads and fills in the minute spaces between them. The entire cocoon is completed in 40 to 70 minutes. The prothoracic leg provides support during cocoon spinning. This microscopic view of the cocoon fibers or threads indicates the closeness of the weaving. Upon completing the cocoon, the mature larva or fairy pupa doubles up into a tight U it then begins to rotate and twist, gradually withdrawing from the larval skin and taking the form of a pupa. The condensed pupal respiratory filaments become inflated. The pupa stretches itself out while writhing and convulsing, and the larval skin is ejected. The entire process takes about 50 minutes. The newly formed pupa is translucent and lies within a pupal skin. The pupa is prevented from being detached by the swift current by a series of dorsal and ventral abdominal hooks arising from the pupal skin. The hooks are V, U, or J in shape and are directed anteriorly, catching in the threads of the cocoon. They also hold the pupal skin in place while the adult is emerging from it. In the Simulium damnosum pupa, two broad primary respiratory filaments surround the head and thorax. Each bears three outer thick-walled upright filaments and three inner branched thin-walled filaments. Three two-day-old pupae are seen here as they appear in nature when viewed under a hand lens. A frequently associated pupa, that of Simulium adersi, possesses 11 long, fine respiratory filaments. Pupation sometimes occurs on the wing pads of a dragonfly larva in a phoretic relationship. On the second day, the head and abdomen of the pupa are dark, yellowish-brown, and the thorax much lighter in color. On the fourth and last pupal day, the pupa is jet black and appears shrunken. The signal that emergence is about to begin is a slow movement or curling of the abdomen. A silvery appearing film of air then forms around the anterior portion of the abdomen within the pupal skin. The air bubble increases posteriorly, enveloping all but the first three abdominal segments. Its pressure causes the adult to appear shortened. This pressure forces the head of the fly against the respiratory filaments which begin to spread apart. The air bubble then moves forward and completely envelops the adult as a form-fitting protective layer. 
the fly continues its slow emergence. It then bunches itself and suddenly shoots upward, bursting through the surface of the water and taking flight instantly. After emergence, the pupal skin remains within the cocoon, held there by the abdominal hooks. The adult fly, two and one half to three millimeters long, has a humped thorax and short antennae of 11 segments. Only the female sucks blood. It usually bites man in the lower parts of the body. The adult is not easily kept alive in cages and does not feed readily on man in the laboratory. It will, however, feed on moist sugar. Females live longer than males. Simulium damnosum is readily distinguished from other African black flies by the enlarged compressed tarsi of its first pair of legs. These tarsi are thickly clothed on the upper surface with short black hairs, apically. Before the female bites, it crawls around to select a suitable place. Its piercing, sucking mouth parts are broad and blade-like. Its bite is painless, but a highly irritating itching wheel develops. The male feeds on flowers and fruit, since its mouth parts cannot obtain blood. The female's eyes are dicoptic or widely spaced, with facets equal in size. After piercing skin with its mandibles, it rasps with its maxillae and feeds on the bloody, oozing surface. If microfilariae of Oncocerca volvulus are in the skin, they may be sucked up. The compound eyes of the male are holoptic or very close together, meeting on top of the head. The upper facets are much larger than the lower ones. The male eye usually is more reddish than that of the female. The male mandibles are small and lack teeth. The slender maxillae bear bristles and hairs instead of teeth. The labium and maxillary palps resemble those of the female. Simulium damnosum females are dissected to ascertain infection with Oncocerca volvulus larval stages. The head, thorax, and abdomen are torn apart with needles, then examined with a microscope. The microfilariae average 300 microns by 8 microns. They may be found in the fly's midgut, hemocele, or thorax. In the thorax, embedded in muscle, the microfilaria shortens and thickens to a sausage form, then grows in length. After becoming a full-grown infective larva, 650 to 760 microns long in seven to eight days, the parasite moves into the head and proboscis. When the fly next feeds on a person, the infective larvae wriggle out between the labelli of the labium, drop off into the wound made by the fly, and enter the skin. The infective larva of Oncocerca volvulus must be distinguished from zoonotic species of Oncocerca developing in Simulium damnosum by checking total length and posterior end. This infective larva has just dropped off a proboscis. Since in Ghana, the female may fly over 100 miles and live up to four and one half months or more, it can disseminate the parasite widely. In the human body, infective larvae may become adult worms in less than one year. A reaction often occurs in the subcutaneous connective tissue surrounding the worms, resulting in formation of a fibrous capsule or nodule in which males and females are coiled together. Nodules vary in size from that of a pea up to about two inches. Some adults may remain free in the tissues. Males are from three quarters to one and two thirds inches long and females 13 to almost 20 inches long. In northern Ghana, most nodules occur on the chest or lower trunk, or in relation to joints. They are often seen at the sides of the chest and on the anterior iliac crest. In Ghana, nodules are also found on the buttock, hip, thigh, scapula, scrotum, scalp, abdomen, elbow, knee, leg, groin, forearm, upper arm, and axilla. In onchocerciasis, changes occur in the skin due to microfilariae and their toxic products. There is severe itching, sometimes depigmentation, lichenification, loss of papillation of the dermis, and degeneration of subdermal elastic fibers. The diagnosis of onchocerciasis is made by snipping off a small piece of superficial skin and placing it in a drop of saline on a slide. 
Any microfilariae that are present wriggle out of the skin snip. In cutting the skin snip, one must not draw blood to avoid confusion with daytime blood parasites such as Loa Loa and Acanthochylonema perstans. Diagnosis is also made by skin scarification, but confusion with blood parasites may result. Another species of microfilaria found in the skin is Acanthochylonema streptocerca, which is transmitted by a tiny fly, Culicoides grammy. The microfilariae of Acocerca volvulus have no sheath and are non-periodic. They are of two sizes, a small form from 150 to 287 microns long, and a larger form from 285 to 368 microns long. In Africa, the microfilariae are found in greatest numbers in the skin of the pelvic girdle, thigh, and calf, and in fluid of a nodule, but may also occur in skin of the ankle, shoulder, scapula, and forearm. Microfilariae may be found in the skin even in the absence of nodules, originating from females lying in the connective tissue. In onchocerciasis, there is a high rate of ocular complications resulting from invasion of the eye by microfilariae. Using the slit lamp microscope shown here, the ophthalmologist can see microfilariae in the patient's eye. Active microfilariae may be seen in the anterior chamber and may be seen dead in the conjunctiva, cornea, and sclera. When microfilariae die in the eye, toxins are liberated. Iridocyclitis and opacities of keratitis may develop. Blindness results from inferior semilunar keratitis or by occlusion of the pupil after a buildup of microfilarial sediment in the anterior chamber. One means of treating orchocerciasis is by denodulization or surgical removal of nodules, thus eliminating a source of microfilariae and of the metabolic products of the adult worm. However, adult worms may lie in the tissues without occurring in a nodule. The white transparent living worms taper at both ends and terminate bluntly. The females are ovoviviparous. Here the uterus has been ruptured and the microfilariae are ready to escape from their sheath. Some natural control of the fly occurs during ectasis of the last larval form. Sometimes the newly formed pupa cannot cast off the enveloping larval skin. It may die within the larval skin or during its writhing it may project out of the cocoon and be swept away by the current. Sometimes when the adult is emerging, a leg may become entangled in the larval skin or pupil filaments. It may try to break free by blowing air into the air film which surrounds it. But if the leg is held too tightly, the trapped fly may blow up the bubble until it bursts, thus drowning the fly. Some natural control results from heavily massed pupae. The emerging adults may be impeded and drowned. Among the water insects associated with simulium larvae and pupae are larvae of caddis flies, which may eat simulium eggs, larvae, and pupae while wandering among them, or may dislodge attached eggs. Biological control of simulium damnosum larvae is affected by caddis flies in the family Hydrocycidae, which eat them after they accidentally enter the silken net of the predator. The caddis larva waits in a tube at the base of its net, emerging to feed on trapped organic debris and microorganisms. If first instar simulium larvae are swept into the nets of caddis larvae, they are eaten rapidly in succession. When a simulium larva enters the net, the caddis larva rushes out, immobilizes it, and may eat it at once, or else it may tie it to the net until it is hungry again. Simulium pupae may also be eaten by caddis larvae. In Ghana, the simulium control unit at Laura in the upper region controls vector larvae with DDT. The DDT is applied every 10 days to the Black Volta River, in which simulium damnosum breeds all year round. In computing the amount of DDT needed, one must know the number of cubic feet of water passing the breeding sites per second. Here, depths are measured to compute the cross-sectional area needed for determining the water discharge. 
the maximum velocity must also be determined. This is done simply by timing green twigs two inches long along a distance of 50 feet. The twig is thrown into the water 10 feet above the zero point. When it reaches the ladder, a signal is given to start the stopwatch. When it reaches the 50 foot mark, the time is recorded. This procedure is repeated six times. The fastest speed is used in computing the river discharge. The amount of DDT concentrate is ascertained so as to yield a dosage of one-tenth part of DDT per million parts of water for 30 minutes. The emulsion is mixed and poured into a drum. A dosage greater than one part of DDT per million parts of water may kill fish. Therefore, the minimum is used which will kill larvae for many miles downstream, up to 40 miles or more, without harming fish. DDT is taken up by microscopic plants and animals, silt, sand, and debris. The simulium larvae are poisoned by ingesting the contaminated particles. DDT may also enter the cuticle of the larva. The larvicide is applied by boat across the river at a convenient point above the breeding places. But the DDT can also be applied from a bridge by means of drip cans. Usually all the larvae detach and die by 24 hours following dosing of the river with DDT. In the minimum effective dose used, one-tenth part per million, there is no effect on simulium eggs because of their protective coating. Therefore, hatching occurs as usual after larviciding. The DDT used in larviciding does not kill pupae either. The adult will therefore emerge from the cocoon as usual. A natural reduction in vector breeding occurs during the dry season when most of the rivers stop flowing. Dr. G.K. Noamasi of Ghana has discovered many hidden perennial flows which have produced thousands of flies in the dry season from certain rivers which formerly were thought to dry up completely. By marking such flies with metallic dusts, he found that they could fly for great distances, such as 46 to 150 miles, to reinfest faraway rivers when the rainy season recommenced. To summarize, the female of Simulium damnosum while feeding on a person with onchocerciasis, picks up microfilariae of onchocerco volvulus from the skin. The microfilariae migrate to the thoracic muscles and develop further. After seven days, they become infective larvae which migrate to the head and proboscis. The infective larvae enter the wound when the fly feeds again. In the person's tissues, they develop into male and female worms, which mate and cause a tissue reaction, resulting in formation of a fibrous capsule or nodule varying in size and appearing as a lump externally. If the microfilariae die in the eye, a reaction takes place leading to keratitis, uveitis, diminished vision, and possibly blindness. <laughs>